local bar was so sure that its bartender was the strongest man around that they offered a, a $1,000 standing bet. The bartender would squeeze a lemon until all the juice ran out of the lemon into a glass, and then he would hand the lemon to a customer. If anyone could squeeze just one more drop of juice out of that lemon, they would win the $1,000. Well, many people had tried over the years, weightlifters, bodybuilders, etc., but nobody could squeeze one more drop out of the lemon. One day, a tiny little man comes in wearing thick glasses, a suit, and he said in a squeaky voice, I'd like to try the bet. After the laughter had died down, the bartender said, okay. He grabbed a lemon, and he squeezed away. Then he handed the, rent, the wrinkled remains to the, of the rind to the man. But the crowd's laughter turned to total silence as the man clenched his fist around the lemon, and they watched not one, not two, but six drops fall into the glass. Everyone in the crowd is shocked. So the bartender says, all right, I'll pay up. And he's paying the $1,000 to the man. As he's delivering the $100 bills into the man, he asks him, you know, I've got to know. You've got to tell me. What do you do for a living? Are you a lumberjack? Are you a weightlifter or what? The man looks at the bartender and replies, no, nah, nothing, like, nothing like that. I just work for the IRS. <laughs> oh, I knew you'd appreciate that. Unless you work for the IRS. In that case, I just want you to know that I love you. I'm just kidding, okay? All right. <laughs> hey, I make fun of the pastors too, so it's all good. Well, praise the Lord. There's your joke of the week. We've been in a series called Vision 2040, which is the vision of this church. Five things I'm believing God for by the year 2040. And we're using the acronym of FAITH, F A I T H to lay this out. The letter F we discussed three weeks ago. The letter F stands for feed and clothe the hurting. We've already seen the letter F come to pass. We're witnessing that right now. Two weeks ago, the letter A, the letter A stands, answer the, stands for answer the cry of our city. And this is another part of the vision that we have seen come to pass. We're watching it come unfold before us right now. And we talked about the, the issue of alcoholism and how it's destroying the families of our community. And much of it is generational. We talked about going after the children and youth of our city because if these young people will surrender their life to God through the power of the Holy Spirit, they will break the curse and change their family tree. 20 years from now, these 10-year-old kids are going to be 30, and they're going to have families of their own. If our city's going to have lasting change, we have to be intentional about teaching our young people the ways of God. So we talked about the bus ministry and how our buses are currently helping us accomplish that. And today we're moving on to the letter I. The message on the letter I is going to be, this is going to be much, much different than the first time I preached this in 2018. The first two letters have been very similar, the messages have been, but this one will be much different. The vision is the same. The vision has not changed, but this message will be much different. I believe that God has given me a great truth to share with you today, and you're either going to, you're going to love this message, or you're going to hate this message. There is no middle ground here, and that's just from my experience, from what I've, what I've seen. And the reason for that is because today what we're addressing, we're, address, we're directly addressing the heart. And when we address matters of the heart, it can become uncomfortable, so with that in mind, I'm going to come at this topic today in a, from a different angle than I ever have before. I'm going, to, I'm going to do something a little different today. Today, I want to try to paint a picture for, for you of what could be if we got this one right. Now, the impact that we're having on our city right now is truly phenomenal, but my friends, we are nowhere close to where we should or we could be. The letter, this letter, the letter I kind of serves as fuel for the rest of the vision. And if we get this right, we can really start advancing the kingdom of God very quickly. If we get it wrong, we slow the advancement down. And if you think we're moving fast now, you haven't seen anything yet, but that's only going to happen if we get this right and each of us decide to do our part. Depending on what version of the Bible you're reading, 
The word prayer is mentioned roughly 500 times. The word faith is mentioned roughly 500 times. But our topic today is mentioned more than 2,300 times. Four times that of the word prayer and that of the word faith. And again, it's because this addresses the heart. With that being said, if you have your Bible or Bible app, we're going to turn to the Old Testament this morning, book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8. We're going to start at verse number 1. Before we read this, I want to set the scene so you understand what's happening. The Israelites have been delivered from slavery from the Egyptians, and God is leading them into the land of Canaan, which is modern-day Israel. So he's delivered them from Egypt. They are traveling to Israel. The Word of God describes this land that he's going to give them as a land flowing with milk and honey. Basically, it's a land of great blessing. So God is taking his people from slavery into blessing. He's taking them from poverty into wealth. Along this journey to the promised land, God gives his people instructions on how to handle the blessing they are about to receive. We find these instructions in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Here is what it says. Deuteronomy 8, starting at verse number 1. The whole commandment that I commanded you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what is in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you, and he let you hunger, and he fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out on you, and your foot did not swell these forty years. Know then in your heart... That as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs, flowing out in the valleys and the hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vine and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper." And you shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Verse 11, take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and you are full and you have built good houses and live in them, And when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, watch this, verse 14, then your heart be lifted up. What does that mean? Pride comes in. And you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you you to do you good in the end. Verse 17, beware lest you say in your heart my power and my and the might of my hand have given me this wealth you shall remember the lord your god for it is he who gives you power to get wealth that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day father i pray for the next few moments that you would give me the mind of christ 
God, that you would anoint me to present this great truth from your word, Lord, that has the potential not only to change our lives as individuals, but change this city. So God, I just pray, Lord, that everyone would hear, Holy Spirit, that you would move. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a common theme we see all throughout Scripture. Numerous times we see this cycle repeated, and here's the, here's the cycle. When God's people are struggling, we see them cry out to God for help. Many times we do that as well. When we're struggling, when we're going through something, we cry out to God for help, and rightfully so. So the season in struggle, they cry out to God, and God will answer, God will deliver, God will provide, God will bless. Then during the season of blessing, the people slowly begin to forget about God. It's interesting, but it's almost as if we forget that it is God is the one that has blessed us. We start to look at ourselves and we start giving ourselves credit for the blessing. And we say things like, it was at the work of my hands that we got out of the mess that we were in. I did that. I created that. It was my idea that helped us to generate this income to get us into a better spot. And when this happens, we become prideful. And James tells us in chapter 4 and verse 6, 6, that God opposes the proud. He even said that when your heart is lifted up. This is why God gives the Israelites the warning he does before they enter the promised land. He gave them this warning before they received the blessing. He says, beware lest you say in your heart that my power and the might of my hands have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. Whatever you do for a living, you are able to do that because God has given you that ability. For some of you, God has given strength. For some, he's given intelligence and knowledge to fix problems or repair things. For some, he's given athletic ability, whatever it might be. Maybe it's musical talent, whatever it might be. God has given that to you. Everything that I have, God has given it to me. And God says, I want you to remember me. Do not forget that I am the one that gave you the power to generate wealth. Nothing you did. It all came from me. Please don't ever forget that. This is the warning he gives the Israelites before they receive the blessing. Because God knows what's in our heart. Let me give you an illustration. Up here on this table I have several different kinds of food. Now God says, I have given you the ability to produce all of this food. This is, this is your table. And God says, nothing you've done, I have given you the ability to produce all of that food. This is your table. It's your blessing. You can do whatever you want with it, even though I've given it to you. You can do whatever you want with it. It's totally up to you. The only thing that I ask in your blessing is that you don't forget about me. Don't forget that I'm the one that gave you the ability because I have a role for you to play in building my kingdom. So here's what I need you to do. The first tenth of everything that I give you, you're to return to me to support my kingdom, to grow my kingdom. So we're gonna make this simple. If I could have you guys, you guys help me. Um, let's just say that, that God gives us Ten, there's 10 of everything up here. 10 stocks of celery. We give, we give one to the Lord. God gives us 10 of these. What is this? It's an acorn squash. All right, my wife knows. All right, we, we give one of those to the Lord. He gives us 10 things of bananas, and we give one of those to the Lord. He gives us 10 things of, of onions. We give one of those to the Lord. 10 things of lettuce, and we give one of those to the Lord. And, and he gives us 10 of defor deformed pumpkin. Oh, butternut squash, that was a deformed pumpkin. He gives 10 of, the, 10 of us those, we give one to the Lord. Carrots, 10, one goes to the Lord. Limes, 10, one goes to the Lord. You're getting my point. Cucumber, 10, one goes to the Lord. Apples, potatoes, I'll give you both. One, 10, one goes to the Lord. Lemons, 10, one goes to the Lord. 
just like that. Now, if you guys could just go ahead, there's food, the, the table's overflowing, just pile as much as you can up there on that table, and we'll, we'll call it good. So, so that's, that's what it looks like. So this is our table, and this is the Lord's table, if you could see that. This is our table, this is the Lord's table, and I want you to see the difference. I wanted you to get a grasp of this and understand this. God says, I have given you the ability to produce all of this. I have given you the blessing. But please don't forget about me. So with the beauty of this is, so with all of this over here, man, if you want to buy a car, then go buy a car. You want to buy a house? Go buy a house. You want to buy a, the newest iPhone? Then God bless you. Go buy the newest iPhone. You want to go out and get yourself a steak? Go out and get yourself a steak. Take me with you, please. You want to spend it on gaming? Go spend it on gaming. You want to invest it? You can invest it. Whatever you want to do, that's the beauty of this. This side is yours. And we can use this side foolishly or we can use it wisely. That's a different message. But it's completely up to you. You choose what to do with it, whatever you want. God says, I'm the one that gave you the ability to get all this, but you're going to decide how to spend it. But not the first 10. All I ask is that you give me back the first 10%. To advance my kingdom. Please don't forget about me. Unfortunately, this is what most people do. And I say most, I'm gonna give you some stats. We have all of this. We have this great table of blessing over here. But we want something. And so we walk over here and we take off of the Lord's table. And we begin to eat off of the Lord's table. And that's what many people do. God says, I've given you all this. This is for my kingdom. This is to help people. This is to further the gospel over here. And I know it doesn't seem like much, but when we all do it together, it compounds. Now, some people will come up to me and they'll say, you know, Pastor, the principle of giving the first 10% to God, that was Old Testament. It doesn't apply to us today. We don't have to do, God doesn't ask us to do that anymore. And I've heard, I've heard this from hundreds, not just a few, hundreds of people over the years. And you can do, you can say what you want, it's between you and God, but it's simply not true. Jesus himself addressed, addressed the tithe in the New Testament when he confronts the religious leaders that, of that day. Now watch this. I want you to see this because there's a great truth here. Matthew 23 and verse 23. These are the words of Jesus. He says, what sorrow, he's talking to the religious people, the religious leaders, what sorrow awaits you teachers of the law and you Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you're careful to tithe even, even the tiniest income from your, from your herb garden, so they're doing this well, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. So let me explain this to you, because there's a great truth here. In this case, the religious leaders were giving back to God, and they were giving back to God very faithfully. They were doing this right, and they were doing this well. Jesus said, even the tiniest part, you're so meticulous, you're even doing the tiniest income that comes to you. What they were neglecting, there are three different things they were neglecting. They were neglecting justice which means they were not being fair to others or they were, they were mistreating certain people. They were not showing, number two, they were not showing mercy, which comes from a Greek word that means compassion. Basically, they were not serving others. And then last, they were neglecting faith, which means they were not practicing what they preached, which is what a hypocrite is, and Jesus calls them that. Now, it's interesting because have you ever heard someone say, I don't serve because I give, or the opposite, they'll say, I don't give because I serve. I'm sure you've heard one of those before. I've heard many believers say those, either one of those statements over the years. But here's the thing, Jesus never tells us to pick one. He instructs us as his followers to do both. In order for the kingdom of God to truly flourish on this earth, all believers need to do both. And when one is neglected, the kingdom suffers. The kingdom does not advance as quickly as it could or as it, sure, as it should. If, if, you, if we didn't have you serving in this church, we could not do what we do. 
If we didn't have you giving in this church, we could not do what we do. They are both equally important in the life of a Christ follower. It's not one or the other. It's both. The Pharisees, they were giving and they were giving faithfully. They had that part down. Notice Jesus said, you should tithe yes. Those are the words of Jesus' New Testament. For you Old Testament people say it's not relevant anymore. He didn't tell them to stop. He didn't have to correct them because they're actually doing this very well. The problem is they weren't serving others and that's what he had to correct. If you research the early church, you'll find that giving to the work of God was actually very, very good. We see in the book of Acts people selling property and even homes to fund the kingdom of God. Overall, people were very generous. Giving wasn't an issue in the early church. However, much has changed over the years. And it seems like the more prosperous we have become, the less we give. Interesting. And God says, be careful you don't forget about me when I bless you. Here are some interesting stats in regards to giving today. These, these stats are the, the stats of just the American church, not worldwide, the American church. Remember, we are one of the wealthiest nations on the planet. If you've never been to a third world country, you will not understand this. If you've seen a third world country, you will understand how blessed we are. It is li- it'll change your life. Because you'll think, oh my goodness, we complain about having no internet and these guys aren't even drinking clean water. It's truly remarkable. I remember when we went to Peru and we seen this firsthand and I preached that morning service, this was years and years ago, through an interpreter, through the, the pastor of that church. He's a missionary. And I remember when the, these guys, we would go, we would take a truck down in the morning. We were building a church. We would take a truck down in the morning and there were, there were men just lined up down the road just begging for work. And so we would we'd get 10, 12 of these guys. They'd jump on the side of the truck and we'd go take off to the church. These guys would work sun up to sundown. And I asked the missionary, I said, how much they get paid? And he said, four American dollars a day. Four American dollars a day, sun up to sundown. And I watch these people. The pastor gives the offering. And these people are coming to the front, giving their offering, the little they had, and they're in tears of joy. And they're celebrating. And I look at him and say, gosh, we don't see this in America. And he said, nope. We are the, one of the wealthiest nations on the planet, the United States. And according to church development, only 5% of churchgoers across America give 10% to the Lord. Interesting fact, though, of those 5% that do give, 77% of those people actually give more than 10%. Isn't that interesting? Those that are faithful actually give more. If every Christian in America remembered the Lord and gave 10%, the kingdom of God would have an extra $139 billion every year. That's billion with a B. That stat is according to the health research funding. We could eliminate world hunger. Imagine that. The God's followers could eliminate world hunger. We could provide clean water for everyone in the world. Every missionary would be 100% fun. You see how fast the kingdom would go here? We would be begging missionaries to go because there would be such a surplus of resources. Every building would be debt-free. If every believer gave, we could literally change the world. So only 5% give regularly the first 10%. 27% of believers give nothing. One in four believers give nothing ever, and then the rest give some. And that statistic baffles me because God has given me all of this to do whatever I want with but I choose to devour it and then eat from his table as well and when I do that people suffer his church suffers as a matter of fact the statistics say that the percentage of giving today in America is lower than it was during the great depression say and some of you will say well man we live in a tough world we do But giving today is still less than it was. We're not living through the Great Depression. You see, in our blessing, what have we done? We have forgotten the Lord. I want you to know that it is, I'm just going to be kind of transparent with you here for a moment. It is absolutely exhausting for me to continually get up here and raise money for things like back to school, a new bus, camp, and on and on and on and on. And if we would get this right, I would never have to do that. I absolutely hate it. And I'm using the word hate here because I do. I cringe every time we need to raise funds for something. That day I got up here a few weeks ago and I was asking, just putting it out there, that what happened on our bus, that we needed a bus. I didn't even want to come to church that day. And I'm not, I'm not saying that before. I really didn't want to come to church that day. 
But who do I, I don't know who to call. I, don't, I, don't, I thought about calling in, but who do I call myself? Tell myself. <laughs> I don't even want to preach this message today. I have, I have stewed on this for three weeks. I've spent more time on this message right here than any other message in recent, in recent past. I don't even want to preach this today because I know what I'm going to hear. I'm going to hear grumbling after the service that people that don't give to God's work and they're going to say, all pastor talks about is money. No, it's not all I talk about. You know that's not true. The truth is I try to avoid this topic like the plague I don't think there's a pastor on the earth, on the face of the earth that likes talking about this. As a matter of fact, the apostle Paul didn't like it. Listen to this. Look at what Paul says to the Corinthian church. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1. He says, now about the collection for the Lord's people. See, they, they still gave and, and tithed into this New Testament church. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Paul says, the last thing I want to do when I get there is, is do a dumb fundraiser. I want to do ministry. I don't want to burden myself with raising the money so we can do the ministry. But see, Paul knew that without the funding, there is no ministry. And so he said, man, if you guys just stay faithful, week by week, every need will be taken care of. There won't be a need for any additional offering. Notice he also says, in keeping with your income. And that's the beauty of God's 10%. Because it's the same for everyone. It's all according to what God blesses you with. And for some, he might bless you with more than others. It's not equal gifts. It's equal sacrifice. And when every one of us, as his followers, gives an equal sacrifice, we can greatly start to advance the kingdom of God. Let me put this into perspective. I'm going to use this church as an example. And when I realize what I'm about to say, man, I'm going to, it, it truly broke my heart. Because I see all that God is using this church to accomplish here in this city. And this made me realize how much more it could be. We could be advancing the kingdom of God much faster than we currently are. If we do an average income of all the adults in this church, just low ball guessing, we're going to say it's $30,000 a year, which is basically a part-time job for everyone. Now, I know some of you don't make $30,000 a year, but some of you make double, triple, five, six times that, okay? So we're using that as an average. I feel like that's a safe number. As a matter of fact, the average median income in the city of Green Bay per person is a little more than $34,000 a year. That was 2022. I'm sure it's probably higher now. So I feel like 30,000 is a great number to use. It's probably actually on the low side, very conservative. So let's just say every adult in this church, just the adults, makes $30,000 a year. 10% of that would be $3,000 to the work of the Lord over the course of the year, set aside to the Lord's table. That doesn't seem like much, but I want you to see what happens when everybody does their part. Using that number as a base annual income, if every person in this church gave back to God by giving the first part of their income, our, act, our annual church income, now listen to this, would more than double from what it is right now. And that's just on the tithe. Think about it. I would never have to raise another dollar for anything. Every need in the church would be taken care of. We could pay down our mortgage at lightning speed. As a matter of fact, we could be debt-free in less than 10 years if everyone just tithed. That's just the tithe. That doesn't even count the offerings that people give that want to advance the kingdom even faster, and we're going to talk about that here in a moment. I think we, we would have enough buses to cover the entire city, advancing us even quicker to the letter A of the vision. Instead, we can barely keep five on the road. By the way, we don't even have five now. The safety inspector took another one off the road a couple of weeks ago because of the rust, and so now we're back down to four buses. Four buses we've had to send to the junkyard this year, and it was tough getting the funds just to replace three of them. And when we took that fourth bus off the road, man, I, I just about cried. And I said, I'm not going to ask again. I'm tired of asking. I'm tired of beating this drum. If, if everyone just tithed, we'd have 15 buses out there on the parking lot today. Think about what we could do if we all did our part. But instead, I have to get up here and i got to do a special push on every piddly little thing just to barely get enough to get by. And then when something breaks down, God help us. And it shouldn't be like that. 
Every time something breaks down, there is a weight that comes over me because I'm the one. i got to figure out how to get the money now to get this thing fixed. And then when I ask for money to get things fixed, I get accused of asking for money all the time, and I don't know what to do. (laughs) I wish there was a book I could read. I don't know. But that's not the way it should be. That's not the way God designed his church to function. Everyone has a part to play. Everyone is a part of the body. As Paul teaches, things break down. Everything man-made is going to break, but if we're all obedient, there should be no problems to cover anything that breaks down ever. And it breaks my heart because if we had people just faithful to the tithe over the seven years we've been here, we would be talking about a whole new vision today because most of this vision and vision 2040 would have come to pass. We'd be so much further along. So the letter I in the vision simply stands for invest in the kingdom. And the goal behind this letter is twofold. Number one, we want to eliminate the debt of this church. It has held us in bondage. The borrower is slave to the lender, the, the scripture says, and we have been slave to the lender for more than 20 years. This has handicapped us for more than 20 years, but I'm thankful for this building because it's a great tool that we could not do what we do without it. So the number one is to eliminate the debt of the church. Number two is to eliminate the debt of the people. It's to eliminate your debt. Because when the people of God, when we're debt free, we can move the needle faster than we've ever moved it before. Now I have found, I have, I have found that people primarily do not give to the work of God for two, one of two reasons. Number one, they don't believe in the mission. You see, when we don't believe in something, we don't give towards it. It's as simple as that. Jesus said, where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. Here's an example. Many people spend a lot of money on the education of their children. It's very common. That's great. We should absolutely do that. Yeah, but why do we do that? Because that's where our heart is. We want to see our children succeed. We, put them in, we spend a lot of money putting them in sports and all these other activities and, because we want the best for them. So we give our time and our treasure into that. We, we put our treasure there. We're naturally, we naturally will give to things and we will purchase things that we are passionate about. But I honestly don't feel that that is the reason that people are not giving to the work of God here in this church. Because if someone doesn't believe in the mission here, they're just going to leave. Especially in a church like this that goes so hard after the lost. Let's just be real. Going after the lost is, is very uncomfortable for a lot of Christians. Going after the lost is messy, and us Christians, we like to talk about it, but we don't like to do it. Let's just be honest with ourselves. It's funny, I was telling the staff this the other day, you know, we've baptized more people this year um, than, we, than we have had in our total attendance when we got here. We baptized more people in here this year than we, than we had total attendance. And when, our, when a church is growing like ours, baptisms are a good benchmark as to what kind of growth you are seeing within your church. Because if no one is baptized, then the growth is primarily happening from people coming from other churches, people that are already saved, and we're not seeing that. That's not what I wanted. We are seeing legitimate people that are far from God coming into this place, they're getting saved, and they're making the public declaration to everyone that they are all in. Anyway, yeah, that's a celebration right there. I was telling the staff, you know, we do get people that attend from other churches, Because people hear what we're doing and they say, man, I want to be a part of that. And people will come up to me and say, you guys are doing exactly what the church is supposed to do. Do you know how many times I've heard that? Everybody says that to me. You guys are doing what the church is supposed to do. And they come and they visit. (laughs) But they don't last long. Because they get here and they realize that we actually do what we say we do. And they say, dear Lord, what have I gotten myself into? I don't want any part of this. This is scary. I tell Dan Betts, our head of security, that he should write a book and call call it, you know you are in an outreach church win, dot, dot, dot. (laughs) Some of our elder meetings, we'll spend 30 minutes just sharing stories of things people say and do around here. Amen. You're going to see some stuff. I just want to forewarn you because we go after lost people. So that brings us to the second reason people don't give. Number two, their priorities are wrong. And when our priorities are wrong, we have no problem devouring all the food on our table while also devouring all the food on the Lord's table. And I'm 
I'm guessing number two is the primary reason people give nothing or they give very little. And I don't, I don't know, guys. I don't go through the books and check all this stuff. I don't check who's giving what, who's not giving, etc. And I don't do that because that information does nothing for me. I, 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 it's not useful to me. So I never do that. I never go through and I look at what people's given or not given. And, and there, some pastors do that. God bless them. They, that's, that, that's, they can definitely do that. I just don't. What you give is between you and the Lord. I have nothing to do with it. Nothing here belongs to me. I just steward it. That's all I do. The building is not mine. The buses are not mine. Nothing is mine. I try to take care of it like it's mine, but it's not mine. That's just my take. I'm just looking at the bottom line numbers overall, and I'm seeing something just adding, adding up. Something is wrong. And I think about all of the lives we could impact if we just did our part. We could change this city. You see the work we do in our city. Think about how many more people we could help if we all just did our part. But if I had to guess, many people are not giving for this reason. I'm guessing it's because our priorities is wrong. Because we have lived in the land of blessing for so long, which is what America is, the land of blessing. We have forgotten the Lord our God. The kingdom of God, the only thing that will last is just not a priority to us. Because in my mind, if I really believe this stuff, if I really believe that Jesus Christ walked this earth, he died on a cross, he rose from the dead, if I really believe that, why would I not want to give to support the greatest work in the history of the world? It doesn't make sense to me. I'm not, I don't understand for the life of me why a true Christ follower, I see 5% across America, and I'm thinking, why would a Christ follower not want to give? Just want to, I want to give. And so many people, we look for reasons not to give to the work of God, and I honestly don't understand it. We'll find scriptures and we'll twist them and see, that's why I don't have to give. And I, I, okay, I believe what you want, but I can't take anything in this world with me when I die except for all the souls I win. Why would I not want to do that? Why would I not want to give? Why would I not want to serve others? If I truly believe this, Maybe I don't truly believe it. The only thing that makes sense to me is our priorities are off. Listen to this. Jesus tells a story in Luke chapter 12, verse 16. Here's what he says. He told them a story. A rich man at a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know. I'll tear down my barns. I'll build bigger ones. I don't have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and I'll say to myself, my friend, you've enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. See, that's just, that's all self. Yeah, self. But God said to him, you fool, you're going to die this night, and then who's going to get everything you worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. Nothing we have we can take with us. The man in this story, he had his priorities wrong. So much good he could have done with what God had blessed him with, but he decided instead to devour the Lord's table as well. So with that being said, we have invested in a resource to help you with this. Because again, a part of this vision is to, be, is to help you get debt free. Go ahead and play that video. How many of you grew up like I did, not rich? Don't be so happy about it. We borrowed for everything. Want a new couch? Go finance it. Want a new TV? Go finance it. We had personal loans, student loans. We were just doing what was normal. It's called staying in debt. What a great idea for a bank. I was so sick and tired of being where we were at. I was living paycheck to paycheck. You just stayed right in the lane where they wanted you. People change their lives when they get sick and tired of being sick and tired, and they finally say, that's it, I've had it! What I love about this plan is it gives you a clear path. This is a wealth-building plan. It's not just a get-out-of-debt plan. A budget is simply a plan for your money. You deal with the money stuff, and all of a sudden, you find freedom and connection everywhere. I feel like I can do more things than I ever could. You can go from where you are to where you want to be. You're free. You just got to get started.
On your seats this morning, you're going to see a card, a postcard type thing that looks like this. It's an invite to Ramsey Plus. If you don't get one, they're, they're going to be at the, at the hub. This is a phenomenal resource that will help you manage your personal finances. There are several videos. That you, this used to all, you had to take a class for this. Now everything's streamlined. It's all online. You can do it at your own pace. It's, it's a wonderful resource. You can do it by yourself. You can do I encourage you to do it with your spouse if you're married. There's an app to track your spending, put a budget together, and so much more. It's, it's all included. Some of you have never been taught the basics of good money management. It's not your fault. You've just not had anybody teach you. So that's what this resource is. All you have to do is take your phone, scan that QR code. It'll take you right to the, the Ramsey website using our, our code as a church, and, and you can get in. If you purchase this personally, it would cost you $130, $130 for an annual subscription, but we have paid the first year for you. We have what's called a site license, so everybody in here can take advantage of this at no cost to you. We flipped the bill ahead of time because this is part of the vision, and I wanted to invest in you. We are making an investment into you this morning. So just scan that QR code. If you don't have a phone, you can't do that. If you go to our website, greenbayfirst.org slash Ramsey, and the link will be on there you just click the link and you can sign up on there but don't just sign up signing up does nothing I want to, please make a point to go on there there's eight nine videos whatever there is tell your we're going to go through one a week or one we're going to go through a couple a week or sit down with your spouse and watch those put the plan together it'll change your life if you do this this is a very very good money management uh, money management tool the second part of the vision is to become debt free as a church in order to do that we have to free up some, some funds in our budget to pay more on our mortgage. And so with that in mind, we're going to be introducing something called Kingdom Builders, which is going to be used to handle some of the vision items and larger projects that we have. Guys, if you want to pull my table up here real quick, um, we're, going to make this, we're going to make this really simple. Here's the thing. I'm not going to get up here anymore, and I'm not going to ask for special offerings for a million different things. That's wearing me out, and if, I, if you were honest, you'd probably say it was wearing you out as well. That type of mindset, it's not suitable for a larger church. We have grown past that model. A smaller church, it's fine, but we've gotten to the place now where we need to make a change. Moving forward, we're going to have two funds to give to. Unless we have a special guest, we'll do a love offering for them. But other than that, we only have, we're going to have two, and I'm going to make this very simple for you. Up here, we have the, the tithe bucket. We've talked about that and the importance of that. That's general. That's most people when they give, they give to that. But then I get up here randomly throughout the year, and I raise money for all these little things. Man, we need, we need money for local missions projects. Will you give to missions? We need, we need camp money. Will you, will you give to camp? We need uh, general outreach things that we do. Buses, oh my goodness, we need another bus. Will you help me with the bus? A toy giveaway. We've got toy giveaway coming up for that. Back to school bash. We need the backpacks. Can you buy a backpack? Egg hunt's coming up. Oh my goodness, and we have global missions projects coming up, and, and I start doing all this, and you're like, and, and we're, on to, we're on to camp, and you're like, well, man, how did the egg hunt go? I don't, I don't remember anything. Do, do we get enough for all the backpacks? I don't, I don't understand. We, how are we doing on this? I don't know where we're at. This is, all, this is all confusing to me, and here's where Kingdom Builders comes in, because we have, we have one big bucket, and so what we're asking you to do, rather than all this confusing stuff, is we're just asking you, we're going to pile all of this stuff together. And I, I didn't make this up. This is, this is other places have done this just with phenomenal results, the, big, you know, the bigger you get. And we're going to put all this stuff into the Kingdom Builders bucket. And so we're going to have tithe, which is the 10%. Then we're going to have Kingdom Builders, which is above 10% for those of you that want to give above and beyond that. And we just ask you, man, all these projects, we just ask you to give to the one big bucket, Kingdom Builders, and then we're going to make sure all of this stuff gets taken care of, and that's the way that works. So just to be clear, the tithe bucket is for the general operation of the church, keeps the lights on, keeps the water running, takes care of the general maintenance around the building, things like that. We are all, as Christ followers, instructed to give the tithe to help God fund God's work. If we're all faithful with just the tithe, we'd never have a financial need. But then you have the kingdom builder's bucket. Kingdom builders is for those of you that want to give above and beyond the tithe. The word of God calls this an offering. You are passionate about seeing the kingdom advance even faster. You are a kingdom builder. So you want to give to that. If we choose to give, if it, this is where we choose to give more from our table to the Lord's table. 
We're giving him the 10%, but we say, man, I, I, I want to give more than that because I want to I really see the kingdom advance, fit, advance quicker. So what you're going to see on your, on your seat there is a, is a kingdom builder faith promise card for the year 2025. If you flip that over to the back, you're going to see the projects that we're hoping to accomplish in 2025. You're going to see the, the camps are on there. The bus ministry is on there. We're, we're needing a couple buses. I, I want four. Outreach events are on there. Local and global missions are on there. Building, we need to upgrade security around here. That's been a need for a long time. A, a new camera system and things like that. Um, parking lot, reseal and stripe. It's coming up now five years since we did our parking lot. Um, total goal is $120,000. If we raise more than that, we can do more. If we raise less... We're going to cut some stuff out. We're going to have to. It's as simple as that. It's just like your, your home finances. If you don't have enough income, you got to cut some stuff. But if we have 120 people just say, hey, I can give $1,000 over the course of the year, we hit our goal just like that. But I know some people can do more. We should easily be able to hit that goal and then some. Our cafe and our kitchen desperately need redone as well. Those two areas are one of the most used areas in the entire church now. That cafe, it just like, it drives me crazy walking through it. They're not on the list for 2025, but if we can raise the, the funds for it, we can get that done as well. We're working on some quotes right now for the flooring and, and things like that because the, the carpet is just trashed. We have an air conditioning repair here in this building that's going to cost us several thousands of dollars, and that's not on there either. We're going to need to purchase a couple more buses next year. I'd love to get four more, like I said, next year if we can raise the funding. I wish all of this stuff was free, but it's not. Nothing is free. I want to send more kids to camp this year than we've ever sent, spent, sent before. Everything costs somebody something. Just because something's free to you doesn't mean it's free to the person that gave it to you. So I want you to take these cards home and I want you to pray over them. I want you to pray, sit down with your spouse and pray what God would stretch you with for the year 2025. This is for the kingdom of God. This is for souls. If you're not currently giving to the tithe bucket, that's where you need to start and then add to it as kingdom builders as you can. On Sunday, November 3rd, so the first Sunday of dual services, three weeks from today, we're going to bring all these back in and I'm believing that that we're going to have a miracle Sunday. I want you to bring your cards in. We're going to collect them all because I just need an idea of what to expect for 2025. I need to say, okay, do we need to cut some stuff? Do we need to scale back on some stuff? Can we do more than, than we were expecting? And so that is the purpose of that. Church, let's get aggressive for the kingdom of God. Let's all do our part and just watch what God does. Amen. Sam, if I could have you come, and if you could bow your heads and close your eyes. God, I thank you for this word today. It's a challenging word. I know some don't like to hear it. I don't even like to give it, but it is so important because, God, this is the fuel that really determines how quickly your kingdom can spread here in the city of Green Bay. And so, for, Father, I just pray, God, these next few weeks as the people had for those that aren't tithing God that that's that's the start and God I just pray Lord Holy Spirit that you would just move let them see God the impact they could have eternally God for those that do tithe and they want to they want to give more they want to see the kingdom they want to become a kingdom builder God I just pray Lord that you would speak to them speak to them in amount whatever that looks like God you know what you want to do in this church, in this city, in 2025. So God, right now, I just ask that you'd move on your people because I believe there's great miracles in this crowd today. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, I want you to keep your head bowed and your eyes closed.